My goal is to continue to open up how we think about and talk about water. Because when we talk about the connection between water and climate change, it tends to only go in one direction, which is the notion that with climate change, there will be added stresses on water resources throughout the world. And that's certainly true, and that is concerning, but what we've left out is something really important that Zach was alluding to, and that is water's effect on climate, because that's something that we can really rally around and work with. We often think of water as a noun, as something bounded by place. After delving into the topic, however, I've come to regard water as a verb. Water is always in motion. It expands in volume or retrenches. It retains or releases energy. It changes state, moving from gas to liquid and back to solid and back again in an ongoing dialogue with land, plants, and sun. This is not just to fuss over language, something that, as a writer, I'm prone to do anyway. Rather, I believe that understanding how water works, how it moves across the landscape and through the atmosphere, can help us not only better manage our farming and urban settings, but also address some pretty large global problems, including <coughs> presenting opportunities to address climate change. Let's break this down and look at various water processes, ways in which water is a verb. We'll start with infiltration. Alan Savory, how many of you all, we haven't really talked about Alan Savory here, but I feel like he's kind of lurking in the background. So Alan um, developed the um, decision-making framework that underlies holistic management. And holistic management, holistic plant grazing, is the use of livestock as a vehicle, as a tool for large-scale land restoration. <laughs> so in terms of water, he draws attention to the fact that when we look at, when we think about does an area have enough water, we tend to think, we tend to look at how much water does that landscape receive. But rather than that, he encouraged us to see that what is important, or more important, is how much effective rainfall you have, how much water actually soaks into the ground. So this slide is from the Dimbengombe Ranch in Zimbabwe, and which I had the chance to visit, which was an extraordinary trip, and I cannot tell you enough of how amazing and inspiring it is. Over the years, over I guess about 12 years, holistic planned grazing has in enhanced water infiltration so that this river extends farther than it has in living memory. And, this is equally important, during the rainy season does not flood the way that it does in nearby parkland. In fact, Alan t um, took us to a point where you, on one side it was the, the parkland and the other side it was the ranch land that they, where they've been um, applying holistic management, and he showed the flotsam that came through, you know, with the with the, the rains and the and the flooding, and in on the parkland the debris was up to here, stuck in trees up to here, and um, and the holistic plan grazing it was up to here. So that's a huge huge difference. I've been talking to people in the permaculture community who have worked to, to restore degraded lands in places like Yemen, Somalia, and Saudi Arabia. And here's their definition of a desert, a place where it floods whenever it rains because there's no capacity for the water to infiltrate. But we know that this state is not inevitable or necessarily permanent because we know that we can restore desertified landscapes. Once the land has the capacity to absorb that water, it ceases to be a desert. Here are a couple of examples of how holistic plan grazing improved infiltration and how transformative that proved to be. 
So when I was in Zimbabwe, I had the chance to, to visit some villages where they are working with the Africa Center for Holistic Management. And so they brought animal impact to their crop fields. And that meant more soil organic matter, which in turn meant better water infiltration. For the people in Sienyanga, Zimbabwe, way off a dirt road near the Wangi National Park, that meant being able to grow food for seven months out of the year rather than what they were previously able to do, which was to grow food only around two months of the year, right around the rainy season. That meant the difference between food self-sufficiency and dependence on international food aid. This is so important. Yesterday we were starting to talk about um, feeding the world, about ensuring food security for the billions of people who live on mar marginal lands. And I can tell you from what these people shared with me that it's no joy to be on food aid. You know, I mean, they were so proud of what they've been able to accomplish. Next, we can look at biodiversity. Um, this is in Chihuahua, Mexico, and I like to show this, this, this slide because I happen to think these are very, very handsome bulls. So um, I went to the Chihuahuan Desert Grasslands where ranchers are working with bird conservation organizations who are creating a biological corridor for endangered migratory grassland birds. The ranchers who practice holistic plan grazing are keeping more water on the land. Now, what their neighbors say is, well, of course you have more water. You get more rain over there, okay? We're talking about their neighbors, like it's like the land is, is right there. And, and so these ranchers are growing a diversity of grasses to feed, shelter, and protect birds that have trouble surviving on desertified land, which, alas, much of the region has become, in large part due to poor grazing practices and also um, the influx of Mennonite farmers. I mean, this just totally blew my mind going to this um, part of Mexico. There are more than 100,000 Mennonite farmers that, are, that have moved down to that area, and they are just plowing up the grasslands. And then, because they want to grow, because they're from Europe, and they want to grow the crops that they're accustomed to from that environment, there, they need tons of chemicals. So anyway, that's a, that's a disaster. However, on these, ranch, these ranches are showing what is possible. And, and so better water infiltration helps to support biodiversity. But it also turns out that the converse is true. Enhanced bi biodiversity means enhanced land function. Creatures from worms to prairie dogs to beaver enhance infiltration by slowing the movement of water and providing water with the chance to linger. So this, this photo is how it starts. Okay, so this is a really bad area of, um, of the land. They had the cattle there very briefly, and you can see that the hoof pushed in seeds that and the, the created a little area where water can pool, and those seeds then had a chance to germinate. Here's another example of using animals. Kelly Mulville is holistically managing sheep in vineyards in Northern California. Thanks to more organic matter increasing at 1% a year, I think that's more than 0.04%, um, and therefore, um, so with all that organic matter, um, there's better water infiltration. And so they were able to reduce irrigation by 90% while at the same time seeing an increase in yield. Originally, Kelly was focused on the land and not the wine, and so he wasn't sure what effect this might have on the taste of the wine, which is actually kind of important if you want to sell the wine. He had the vintner do a blind test, and guess what? The grapes grown with sheep produced a tastier wine. Now, transpiration. I interviewed Antonio Nobre, author of a report called The Future Climate of Amazonia. The Amazon rainforest has about four billion trees. 
Together, these trees act like geysers and spout a river of vapor into the air, an aerial river through which flows five times as much water as the Amazon River itself. This flying river is the result of transpiration, the upward movement of water through plants. You can think of it as the plant sweating, the stomata on the leaves, or if grass, the blades, open to retain or release moisture to cool the plant itself and the nearby vicinity. What's important is that this is a cooling mechanism, transforming solar heat into latent heat suspended in vapor, as opposed to sensible heat or heat you can feel, like a hot sidewalk. According to Czech botanist Jan Pokorny, the transpiration activity of one tree on a one sunny day represents three times the cooling capacity of an air conditioning system in a five-star hotel. This is huge, if scarcely noticed, as a climate opportunity. Think of all the degraded land out there that is absorbing solar heat that, with a change in management, could regain its temperature regulating capacity. Transpiration also drives the movement of water. There's an excellent paper by biologist Douglas Shield called How Plants Water Our Planet. It begins, most life on land depends on water from rain, but much of the rain on land may also depend on life. He looks into new research showing that vegetation has an influence on rain and rainfall patterns. Most significant are trees, as we've seen, they are champion transpirers, but also grasses. Transpiration from plants accounts, to eight, accounts for 80 to 90 percent of the atmospheric moisture over land, and this is important for rainfall. According to the nonprofit We Forest, about 40 percent of rainfall over land is recycled from evapotranspiration from landscape surfaces. So evapotranspiration is the com combination of the transpiration through the plants, but also the evaporation through the surrounding soil. Ecologists are starting to use the term precipitation shed to describe the source area of land and water that generate a region's rain. Transpiring plants also keep water in the local system. I talked to one rancher, Michael Thompson, from Kansas, who believes that <coughs> these dynamics make a difference on his land. He says that when there is a lot of fallow in the area, he observes that the rain seems to split and go around him. Finally, condensation. This is the process of water vapor turning back to liquid. It is closely connected with transpiration. You can think of it as its meteorological mirror. One reason that with plant cover, Thompson sees, sees more rain could be that those plants are releasing minute particles, aerosols, that provide a surface for water to condense around. We call these precipitation nuclei. There's a lot of research happening right now about the microbiology of rain and how bacteria and various volatile organic compounds, Antonio Nobre calls it fairy dust, from plants plays a role in creating rainfall. Here is a landscape, aha, here is a landscape defined by condensation. It's a cloud forest in central Mexico. There are many <coughs> trees in certain ecosystems that specialize in fog that comb moisture from the air to obtain water. This is in the Sierra Gorda um, in the state of Quevedo and where one third of the state has been declared a biodiversity reserve, thanks to this organization really, really working very hard to make that happen. This cloud forest is being preserved by giving the local people alternatives to bringing their cattle into this fragile area. Um, so in this, in this area, which is you know, way, way up in the mountains, um, when we went up there, the, the driver suggested that I, that I take, um, I'm blanking on what it's called, you, um, you know, so that you don't get car sick, you know, we're just like going up and up and up. Um, so people are very, up there are very disconnected from like the larger economy. So the only way that they could make a living had been to basically destroy their own resources, their natural resources. So what the Sierra Gorda 
um, ecological group did is have done is that they've created lots of micro enterprises, including um, food, um, little casual restaurants that allow them to make, maintain their culinary traditions and artisan operations and ecotourism, and all uh, and different and teaching them how to grow crops in ways that work well with the landscape so that these forests can, can be preserved, so that they're not going in there. Condensation is also a source of water. I write about a couple in far west Texas who designed their rain barn to collect condensation. They didn't realize how much they were capturing until the winter morning, four months after the last rain, when their water tank, pictured here, overflowed. Australian farmer Chris Hangler, who manages an area of land the size of the five boroughs of New York, says that he pays as much attention to dew as to other sources of water, as it supports a healthy ecosystem and microclimate. He says, there are all those additional microorganisms that can keep active throughout extended periods well after the rainy season as long as they get a watering each night. In a living system, moisture generates more moisture, he says, of which dew is one manifestation. So, um, you know, I'm just about, just about done. I'll just, um, Zach was alluding to this, but let me see if I can do a little bit more. Just kind of trying to connect some, make some connections between these processes and some extreme weather events, such as hurricanes, that we've been experiencing. Um, this is a paper that Douglas Shield, who I've mentioned before, has done. So in, in what I've described to you about water being a verb, we get a sense of moisture moving around, of landscapes with plant cover, which are cycling moisture, and other landscapes which are bare and desert-like. Basically, we're dealing with a distorted energy cycle. And this is really important because when in, in most public discussions of climate, it's talked about, in, climate change is talked about in terms of energy. But they mean energy like fossil fuels and, and, and batteries and solar panels. But let's think of energy in its most basic way, solar energy. What happens when that raw solar energy hits the earth? Does it get, is it mediated through plants and therefore the temperature is regulated or does it just sit there because the soil has become dirt and nothing grows? So yeah, so that's just something I really like to have us hold for a minute. Um, there's an interesting quote from one of the founders of the field of modern meteor meteor oh boy, meteorology. Heat energy becomes kinetic energy with parched landscapes in the west of, our, of the US and I think increasingly Canada, all that heat energy moves unimpeded until it hits the moisture that had been blocked you know, in the east. So restoring the small water cycle, keeping water in place is what is needed, you know, or um, as Zach says, water reten you know, retaining landscapes, keeping that water on the, in the ground which comes back to restoring our degraded landscapes and rebuilding the soil sponge, which is what we all are working towards here. Thank you.